Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker, Her Excellency, the Governor of New South Wales, Professor Murray Bashir. relating to this region of exceptional beauty and indeed beyond. A land in which we are privileged to reside and to appreciate at close hand the legacy of this caring, caring area in Australia. Increasingly, Australians are becoming aware of our indebtedness to those who laid the foundations, those who contributed significantly to the history of modern Australia. And tonight I shall refer to the early colonial governors, including any associations with they, which they may have had mm -hmm. with this region. But perhaps beyond that, the legacy of the fifth governor, Lachlan Macquarie, whose influence has been firmly embedded, I believe, in the Australian character and spirit of which we are so proud. And finally, if there's time, or question time, I'm happy to share some reflections on the role of the Governor today. Well, at the outset, however, I wish to record my very deep respect for the traditional custodians of this land upon which we gather, the Borrogado tribe, their ancestors and their descendants, indeed for all Australia's Indigenous people who have nurtured this land for tens of thousands of years. Certainly, one member of the Borrogable tribe has been immortalised in the history of modern Australia within its early colonial history. His name is no doubt familiar to all, Bungaree. Aged 13 at the time of the arrival of the first fleet in 1788, Bungaree was reared in a traditional way amongst his people whom Captain Arthur Phillip, our first governor, declared to be the healthiest people whom he had encountered in any of his travels around the world. However, within a few years after European settlement, substantial numbers had died of smallpox. Phillip, from the outset, displayed a genuine attitude of respect for the Indigenous people on first encounter and it is recorded that he stated soon after his arrival, we must do all that we can to reconcile them to have us living amongst them. Well, the Mosman region features in several significant ways in the history of early colonial Sydney. And of course, this is where the Borogable people come, came from. Facing the danger of starvation in the colony before farming, had become adequately productive. Governor Phillip, in 1789, the year following the arrival of the first fleet, had sent his ship, HMS Sirius, to Cape Town via the Cape of the Pope to purchase vital food. However, on the return voyage, Sirius was severely damaged, storms and icebergs. On arrival in Sydney, she was taken to be careened and repaired at Elbow Cove, later renamed Careening Cove, then Sirius Cove, that safe haven 
known today as Mosman Bay. Documents relate, and I quote from those documents, a temporary wharf was built, we're talking about 1789, some saw pits dug, and a piece of ground was leveled to make, to make working easier. It seems that the series was somewhat accident prone, for under the command of Lieutenant John Hunter, who was later to become the second governor of New South Wales, the Sirius suffered a mishap, again, navigating the rough waters into Norfolk Island. It is noteworthy that the Sirius crew were so loyal to John Hunter that in the later inquiry, none would give evidence passing judgment on the leader's navigational mistake. Sounds like Australian work. <laughs> <laughs> Although it may seem an extraordinarily bizarre ambition on contemplation today, Napoleon Bonaparte, in the first years of the 19th century, is said to have had an intention to invade Australia and ensured that any French explorers in these parts returning home were to be interrogated about the advantages they, that they had noted in their explorations in these regions. Hence, military, security, and vigilance were critical issues. And Mossman, because of its strategic location, has always played a role in the planning of security for our great harbour. From 1801, on the initiative of the third governor, Philip Gidley King, and let me tell you, we have a descendant of Philip Gidley King here with us tonight. Wonderful thought. So on the initiative of that third governor, Philip Gidley King, who governed from 1800 to 1805, and who had been third in command of the first fleet, on his instruction, a battery of fortifications was established in George's Head. And this site proved to be an ideal vantage point from which to identify promptly any French ship or other hostile intruder sailing into the harbour. Governor King was also responsible for the first underground tunnel, which was created on this headland to be used for the storage of ammunition and other vital needs for the military personnel there. The main arterial road of Mossman, which leads towards these defences, was indeed appropriately named Military Road. However, evidence of any association with this region by the fourth governor, William Bly, is difficult to, to locate. Indeed, the unfortunate Bly, having survived the mutiny on Achimus Bounty, and the long journey in an open boat from Norfolk Island to Timor was destined to face another mutiny by the New South Wales Corps during his term of governor. A term brought to an abrupt end after only 17 months in office. It must be noted to his credit, however, that this much maligned fourth governor directed his attention more to encouraging food production rather than maritime exploration. Because of these efforts, Bly engendered much support and loyalty from the early farming community of the Hawkesbury, who kept loyal to him even during the insurrection. Appointed as the fifth governor, subsequent to the Bly crisis, Lachlan Macquarie arrived on the last days of 1809 to be sworn in as the fifth governor on the 1st of January, 1810. A search through the journals of Lachlan Macquarie, which I have, describing his tours as governor, is rewarded with a mention of George's hit. I shall present his exact words as he was setting off for Tasmania in 1821. And these are his words. Monday the 9th of April, last night, had nearly proved fatal to us. The ship having drove and dragged her anchor for nearly a mile from the spot where she first anchored near the south shore towards George's head on the north shore before she brought up, which she did not till she was within 20 yards of the breakers and rocks 
immediately under those high cliffs of George's head. Macquarie, with the support of his splendid wife, Elizabeth Campbell, was determined to make a positive difference to the chaotic, disintegrating and unhappy colony which he was now destined to lead and on whom he would bestow a legacy, contrib contributing significantly to the Australian identity which defines us today. As we look back on Macquarie's life and character, it is striking to note how much of this remains relevant to the concerns of modern Australia. Community inclusiveness, the well-being of the nation's Indigenous people, including access of their children to education. The health of the people, including mental health. Investment in architectural quality and town planning. And these are but a few aspects of his legacy. However, it is doubtful whether Lachlan Macquarie himself would or even could have envisaged the high regard in which he is held today. It has been remarked before that an aura of failure, frustration and rejection has too often been the reward of many of Australia's early leaders. It was certainly true of many of the best known colonial governors. And sadly it must be acknowledged that Lachlan Macquarie was another victim of such misfortune, denigrated by many of the influential and powerful during his term of office in New South Wales. And later, following the Commission of Inquiry called in 1819 by the British government because of his humanitarian policies and civic development, they were the reasons, he was discredited unjustly in official circles in Britain. Yet he stands today as one of the greatest of Australia's leaders certainly one of our greatest governors, a true pioneer of the nation, unmatched for vision, magnanimity, compassion, and a zest for accomplishment. Many will say he is the founder of modern Australia. Indeed, he was the first governor to officially refer to Australia by that name. In 1817, endorsing the name first used by the young Matthew Flinders following Flinders' circumnavigation of the Australian continent in 1802 and three, He was the first to give official recognition to Australia Day. In 1818, he decreed that this date, January the 26th, which he entitled Anniversary Day, would be a public holiday for government workers. Like so much of his legacy, that observance has endured. Certainly no governor came to office with a richer fund of experience, nor a deeper apprehension of life's trials and hardships. He was born on January the 31st, 1762, in modest circumstances in Scotland, on the Isle of Ulva in the Hebrides, where he later worked on the family farm. His father was a cousin of the last chieftain of the clan, whom Dr. Samuel Johnson and James Boswell had visited in 1773. Some years later, those travellers recorded that the family had fallen on hard times, that's the Macquarie family, requiring them to sell the island which had been in the family's possession for 900 years. Macquarie's father had died when Lachlan was only 14 years of age, but his maternal uncle, Murdoch Maclean, Baron of Moy, had ensured that the boy received some formal education in Edinburgh. However, the outbreak of the American War of Independence in 1776 brought an end to his schooling, and the following year he received an ensign's commission to serve with his cousin's regiment in North America. At war's end, he returned to the family farm at Mull before leaving three years later to return to the army. Scholars researching Macquarie's character are convinced also, as I am, 
that ideas, the ideas and the values of the Scottish Enlightenment were influential in his maturation of character, his humanitarian attitude to convicts and to the marginalised, and it was also influential in his commitment to civic planning. These Australian researchers have sought to identify the pathways whereby such qualities had developed in the young man, those qualities which resonated with the values of the Scottish Enlightenment. For Macquarie's years of military service had not allowed time for reflective studies. It is noteworthy, however, that association by Macquarie with certain individuals imbued these ideals and values. In particular, mention should be made of Sir James McIntosh, who had spent seven years in Bombay, India, serving as recorder, that is, the senior judge there. Macquarie had encountered Sir James during his second period with the British garrison at Bombay, serving as military secretary to the British governor there. As a brilliant and scholarly schoolboy of Inverness, young Jamie McIntosh had been described as, and I quote, a prodigy of learning and talent. McIntosh went on to study medicine at Edinburgh, no better place in the world in those days, practising as a doctor for a few years, subsequently realising that little could be done to help those who had tuberculosis or infectious illnesses or pneumonia. He then changed and directed his studies to law, a profession through which he believed he could help in those times more individuals. Macintosh distinguished himself in academia, in philosophy, as an author and through his involvement in a number of celebrated cases, as well as serving later as a member of the British Parliament. Macintosh's friendship with Macquarie endured over their lifetime, and he steadfastly remained supportive after Macquarie's return to Great Britain from Australia to conf confront the criticism of the British Parliament after Commissioner Biggs' inquiry. In 1807, whilst in India and contemplating new horizons, Macintosh had written of his desire to be, and I quote him verbatim. If I could be, he said, the law giver of Botany Bay, if I could rescue at least the children of the convicts from brutality and barbarism by education, with a store of schoolmasters from Lancaster, with some good Irish priests for their countrymen and good Methodists for the rest. <laughs> and we're in a Methodist church. I should most joyfully endeavour to introduce law and morality into that wretched country and give it the fit constitution for a penal colony which would grow into a great and prosperous community. So this was a man who was talking to the young and impressionable Macquarie, you see. Macquarie was 15 when he joined the army as a volunteer and served in the American War of Independence in New York and Charleston and uh, in the 71st Highland region and also in Canada and Jamaica. Later he served in Egypt in 1801 against Napoleon's armies after having accompanied his regiment on his first posting to India in 1788. There he had married his first wife, Jane Jarvis, whom he had met in Bombay, but with the deterioration of her health from tuberculosis, they journeyed to Macau in the hope that the change of climate would bring about improvement. Sadly, her deterioration continued and Jane died. By the age of 40, Macquarie was already a seasoned traveller, hardened by war, very much a man of the world, and well known in influential circles in London. Returning to Britain in April, April 1807, after a further period of service in India, he narrowly escaped drowning when a freak wave capsized the small ship into which he had transferred in the Persian Gulf. 
He was saved by being washed ashore extraordinarily at a place called Bashir. <laughs> Unable to travel through the Mediterranean because of the war with France, Macquarie journeyed overland via Baghdad through Persia and the north to St. Petersburg, where he called upon the Tsar Alexander I, then via Denmark and Sweden to London. Clearly, he was a man of high resilience and an exceptional immune system. After such adventures, a mere six months journey to New South Wales would have seemed almost routine. Yet for all his outstanding qualifications, he was not the British government's first choice for the job. The man chosen as Bly's successor was Major General Miles Nightingale, who had resigned his appointment, no doubt when he heard about the story of the New South Wales Corps before his departure for New South Wales citing poor health. Macquarie, already designated to be the Lieutenant Governor, offered himself as Governor and was subsequently appointed. He was now 48 years old and in November 1807 he had married his second wife Elizabeth Campbell, who would prove to be an ideal partner. Nevertheless, they were to be met with a considerable challenge, a challenge to test their splendid characters to the full. In Macquarie's own somewhat dismissive words, the colony was, and I'm quoting, barely emerging from an infantile imbecility. Uh. Ellis, one of Macquarie's biographers, has written, the country was divided by a faction as a result of the Blythe Rebellion and was almost starving. Its morals were in the lowest state of debasement. Public buildings were in ruins, roads and bridges were impassable. There was no public credit or private confidence. Macquarie's first step towards mending these depressing conditions was to bring together the warring sections of the colony through the institution of official gatherings and community functions, among which the and his first horse races and agricultural fairs were notable, and the first horse races were at high time. That was Macquarie's way two centuries ago, reflected still, I believe, in the Australian preference for conciliation and consensus, for negotiation, discussion, and community involvement rather than the brute exercise of authority. Deeply depressing conditions, however, existed in the colony he had inherited, which he immediately set about transforming. In the years that followed, he led the colony into a period of unprecedented progress, and in many ways he set the pattern and defined the priorities of enlightened public administration for the modern era. He built schools, hospitals, roads, and a beautiful lighthouse at the entrance to Sydney Harbour. Indeed, he built on a scale not seen before. It was he who instituted a system of public and private education, and his influence can be seen today in the continuing emphasis given to education by all Australian governments. Indeed, 200 years ago, he saw the critical role of education in building a nation and made it one of his first priorities. At the end of his period as governor, and by now the wool industry was thriving and other parts of the rural economy, one-fifth of the colony's revenue was being spent on education. It is so appropriate that a fine and progressive university in Australia now bears his name. To a large extent, Macquarie established the nation's economy, encouraging free enterprise and creating an environment in which commerce and manufacturing could flourish. In 1813, it was he who introduced coinage. He arranged the purchase of 40,000 Spanish silver dollars, valued at 10,000 pounds. Cutting out the centre, 
two new callings were created, a holy dollar and the dump with a value of 15 pence. In 1817, the colony's first bank, the Bank of New South Wales, opened its doors, and the highly successful Macquarie Bank, now the Macquarie Group, established in 1985, creatively has adopted Macquarie's holy dollar as its defining emblem. Under Macquarie, the colony acquired its first courthouses, its first magistrates, some were emancipated convicts, its first places of public worship, its first independent newspaper. And when he left office in 1821, he could point to 265 public works carried out during his term, many designed by Francis Greenaway, the former convict appointed civil architect, a great architect, who incidentally had been given a letter of recommendation from, from the retired first governor, Arthur Phillip, whom he knew from that beautiful city of Bath. Significant buildings still standing from Macquarie's time include Hyde Park Barracks, the governor's stable, now the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, the lighthouse near the entrance to Sydney Harbour, the female factory at Parramatta and more. Roads to Parramatta and to the Blue Mountains were constructed in the five planned Macquarie towns, Richmond, Pitt Town, Castle Ray, Wilberforce and Windsor, all built beyond the reach of the floodwaters from the Hawkesbury. And Wilberforce he named after the great reformist whom he admired so much for his anti-slavery campaigns. Campbelltown, now a satellite city 50 kilometres beyond Sydney, was established and named after his wife. Certainly on looking around the city of Sydney, one sees evidence of his creativity and zeal. So many of the streets bear the names he chose, including the fine thoroughfare named after himself. Certainly Macquarie's vision extended far beyond Sydney. He encouraged exploration to expand, expand the supply of pastoral land, famine being an ever-present threat in a colony still relying on shipments of food. Following several failed earlier attempts, but with continuing encouragement, the successful crossing of the Blue Mountains had been achieved in 1813 by Blackstone, Dawson and Wentworth. So we'll have some wonderful celebrations in this year. The road was commissioned the following year and built in an extraordinary six months. The road over the Blue Mountains and the road there today virtually follows that same road. So that was a gateway to the pasture lands beyond, heralding the future of prosperous rural Australia. Further exploration flourished, and it can be claimed that the inland city of Bathurst was essentially Macquarie's creation. Macquarie's journal, recording his first view of this region, was indication of his delight. As he rode with Elizabeth over the Blue Mountains and looked down upon the plains, and this is what he said, expanding for many miles on both sides of the river and surrounded at a distance by verdant hills, is truly grand, beautiful and interesting, forming one of the finest landscapes in any country I have yet visited. Macquarie promoted cultural and civil amenities. He can be accounted the first vice regal supporter of local literature as well as art. An artist including former convict Joseph Lysett, and he certainly was the only governor in history to appoint a poet laureate. That was Michael Massey Robinson, whose stipend was the welcome annual gift of two cows. In regard to an association of Macquarie with New Zealand and the adjacent Pacific Islands, as implied in the word Australasia, 
Macquarie's domain of responsibility as Captain General and Governor in Chief of New South Wales included the whole of Eastern Australia, Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania, the adjacent Pacific colony of Norfolk Island and New Zealand. Indeed, it may be claimed that Macquarie had a direct connection to the establishment of the New Zealand dairy industry. In 1814, the Reverend Samuel Marsden, with missionary zeal, travelled again to New Zealand to meet with Maori tribes. He took with him the first dairy cows introduced into that country. These were short horns, known at the time as Durham's, and were taken from the New South Wales Crown Bird, a gift from Governor Macquarie. For many decades afterwards, this was the most popular breed in New Zealand and a precursor of New Zealand's rich dairy industry. Another of Macquarie's priorities, another link with the Australia of today, was his emphasis on public health. He showed a concern for the sick, the poor, the neglected and the marginalised beyond anything required by the duties of office. With the inspirational support of Elizabeth, he took a particular interest in the welfare of children, especially the destitute and the abandoned. These children represented all groups within the wider community. The children of convicts, children whose parents had died en route to Australia, even Aboriginal children referred by colonial clergymen. A beautiful site for the female orphan school was chosen, with views sweeping down to the river, a scene which evoked from Elizabeth memories of Eads, her home in Scotland, and from the 1806-1807 architectural books, pattern books, of Edward Gifford, which Elizabeth had brought with her to Australia. A gracious building was chosen which stands today restored to its original beauty, proudly part of the campus of the University of Western Sydney at Drydon Mill. And the hand-painted frieze around the wall, painted in Macquarie's time, is still there. This female orphan school was the fledgling colony's first building created for a charitable purpose. It is said that Elizabeth and Lachlan even designed the pinafores for those orphan children. There can be no doubt Macquarie and his wife were aware of the links between poverty, disadvantage, sickness and crime. Elizabeth's intellectual independence and acumen proved major strengths in the implementation of Macquarie's reforms. His undisguised admiration for his wife's abilities was evidence, I believe, of the value he placed on women as equal partners in both marriage and in society at large. For a contemporary governor, especially one with a professional and personal interest in mental illness and the plight of the traumatised, Macquarie's example continues to be an inspiration. In 1810, he established the colony's first psychiatric hospital, the Castle Hill Asylum, which received its first 30 patients from Parramatta Jail. Mm. It is remarkable that over 200 years ago, Australia had a governor with an insightful and sympathetic understanding of the needs of the mentally ill and the not infrequent association of mental illness with imprisonment. Macquarie's attitude to Aboriginal people was similarly enlightened, though it is important that this not be exaggerated. He established the first school for Aboriginal children and made the first official attempts, though unsuccessful, to settle native people in agriculture. John Ritchie, another of Macquarie's biographers, has given a touching account of Macquarie's final parting just prior to leaving Australia, his parting from the Aboriginal chiefs whom he had grown to know and to respect. In the last days of his governorship, 
He went with Elizabeth to say goodbye to the clans gathered at Parramatta. Richie, his biographer, wrote, As the Aborigines feasted on roast beef washed down with copious draughts of beer, he examined the children of the native institution which he had established at Parramatta in 1815. He knew that the rapid increase in British population and the progress of British agriculture had driven these people from their ancient habitations. And in the quarry's words, our contact with Europeans in the townships had degraded the blacks. It was, however, Macquarie's treatment of the convicts in his charge that earns continuing respect and admiration today. This was more than humanitarianism. It was nation building based on merit. The colony was in need of a workforce, the larger the better, and Macquarie believed that when a prisoner had discharged his debt to society, he should be, and these two are his words, eligible for any situation which he has, by a long term of upright conduct, proved himself worthy of filling. This policy of emancipation was the child of Macquarie's heart, more instinctual than theoretical. In his softer moments, which he actually wrote, he viewed the convicts as children of misfortune, Believing in the intrinsic worth of individuals, he offered them hope. He aimed to encourage redemption, to promote self-respect and ultimately a social regeneration. He nurtured a dream of what the new country might become in raising people to be positions of trust and authority. He drew no distinction between the free and the freed. His objection was to eliminate faction and to introduce harmony. In Macquarie's example of tolerance and humanity, I am convinced that we see the beginnings of the Australian tradition of the fair go. The spirit of egalitarianism, the sense of fair play that many regard as our defining characteristic as a people. He believed that everyone deserved a second chance, whatever his past deeds or reputation. However, to a large extent that belief was his undoing and destructive repercussions to his reputation and visionary leadership would emanate from an unexpected source. For despite the relief and the jubilation in Great Britain engendered by the victories over Napoleon, by 1815, and the end of years of war with France, there were significant negative social consequences for the victorious nation. Hundreds of men who had been pressed into army and naval service to counter Napoleon's aggression now found themselves without employment, without income, without food, and consequently vulnerable to criminal behaviour for survival. The British government expected and hoped that the spectre of transportation to a cruel and punitive convict colony would act as a harsh deterrent to criminality. They could not countenance that their penal colony offering emancipation and humane opportunity would represent an attractive alternative. And letters and messages are coming back that it was heaven down here and held wonderful and care in the government box. So continuing complaints were being sent to London by the exclusives. That's a word with a capital E, you know, a noun. The free settlers from the Reverend Samuel Marsden known justifiably as the flogging person and an implacable enemy of Macquarie together with affluent landholders, including John MacArthur, father of Australia's wool industry, but described by some as a dedicated troublemaker. Indeed, a list of Macquarie's enemies from the Governor's Dispatches of 1817 is held in the archives of the State Library of New South Wales. 
and includes the names of many of these seditious individuals. Eventually, a combination of many factors led to the appointment in 1819 of J.T. Big, B-I-G-G-E, Big Street, Liverpool, you may know, to conduct an inquiry into Macquarie's colonial administration. Big had been given explicit instructions by the British Secretary for the Colonies, Earl Bathurst, that, and I quote those very words from the parliamentary document, transportation should be made an object of real terror and any weakening of this by ill-considered compassion for convicts in the humanitarian policies of Governor Lachlan Macquarie should be reported. Big's damning report, the most censorious elements of which included judgmental accusations about the governor being too compassionate and spending on building construction, was deeply wounding to Macquarie's pride and reputation. But never did he abandon his faith in human decency and the principles of fairness for which he stood throughout his term. One aspect of Macquarie's legacy which is infrequently described was his ecumenical spirit and particularly his attitude to dissenters and the Catholic citizens of the colony, for whom the exclusive showed neither acceptance nor respect. Research of historical documents that reveal that Macquarie provided land at Parramatta for the first Wesleyan chapel. And as early as 1810, the first year of his governorship, Macquarie had already acknowledged the importance of St. Patrick's Day to the Irish immigrants and exiles, and had instituted an annual celebratory dinner. Indeed, it is reported at, at the request of the leader of a gang of around 50 Irish convicts engaged in work at government house, Elizabeth granted permission for a short break for them to observe St. Patrick's Day. On their return later, they were greeted with a table of traditional Irish fare, of stew, molasses pudding, and wheat grog, a touching example of Elizabeth's humanity, and so early in the Macquarie's term of office. This was March 17, and they'd been sworn in on the 1st of January that year. And further, on the 3rd of May, 1820, Fathers John Ferry and Philip Connolly arrived in Sydney to celebrate Mass officially for the first time following the rebellion of the Irish convicts many years earlier and the Battle of Binnaker Hill on the outskirts of Sydney. Later, Macquarie gave land for their chapel in Sydney, the site of today's St Mary's, and donated 20 guineas to the building and laid its foundation stone on the 21st of October, 1821, promising to support the religious liberty of Father Ferry's flock, which was met with spontaneous applause. And I should tell you too, that the priest handed Governor Macquarie a trowel and said, this might help you, Governor. And he said, don't you worry about me, Father, I'm a mason. <laughs> I know how to use one of these. So he had a great sense of humour as well as that wonderful overall embracing spirit. Perhaps the true grandeur and pathos of Macquarie's story are best summed up in his own words. All that he passionately believed about his policies of emancipation, the motivating impulse of charity and love that underlay all his actions were poured out in the submission he wrote to Commissioner Big. And I own the reports of both Big and Macquarie in response. Here I present part of what he wrote to Big. He said, at my first entry into this colony, I felt, as you must do, that some of the most meritorious men most willing to exert themselves in the public service were men who had been convicts. Do you not know? 
know that about nine tenths of the population of this convict are this colony are or have been convicts or the children of convicts. You have yet perhaps to learn that these are the people who have quietly submitted to the laws and regulations of the colonies. Although informed by some of the free settlers and officers of government that they were illegal. These are the men who have tilled the ground, who have built houses and ships, who have made wonderful efforts in agriculture, in maritime speculations and in manufacture. These are the men who placed in the balance, in the opposite scale to those free settlers, you will find to preponderate in character, both moral and political. Macquarie's words would have little influence on Big's decision. Big had been influenced by the malcontents and the disgruntled. Increasingly dispirited, Macquarie tendered his resignation on three occasions, and this finally took effect in 1821. But there is a pleasing irony in the thought that were it not for the conflict of those men, New South Wales might have waited much longer for the rudiments of a parliamentary democratic system. Big recommended that no future governor should be allowed to rule as an autocrat. So a legislative council was appointed to advise the next governor. There is no doubt that in so many ways Macquarie was ahead of his time. He had committed himself throughout his years of office to a vision of what Australia could become. And in so doing, he laid the foundation for the harmony and the prosperity which would follow. At the inauguration of his successor, Governor Thomas Brisbane, on de December the 1st, 1821, Macquarie farewelled the colony which he had come to love, beginning with the words, fellow citizens of Australia, and predicted that Australia would, in less than 50 years, become, and I quote him again, one of the most valuable appendages of the British Empire. There, further, he declared, I shall not fail on my return to England to rec recommend in the strongest manner I am able to my sovereign and to His Majesty's government their early attention to the amelioration of this valuable rising colony and to extend to it their paternal support and fostering protection. By 1880, that was virtually <laughs> just a few years beyond his prediction of 50 years. It was estimated that Australia had the fastest growing economy and the highest per capita income in the world, and that almost 40% of Australia's borrowed capital was coming from Scottish banks. On the eve of his departure, February the 11th, 1822, thousands gathered in the streets and around the coves of Sydney to farewell to farewell him, described by the governor himself in these moving words. A most affecting scene and could not be viewed by Mrs Macquarie or myself without the deepest emotion. After a residence of upward of 12 years amongst these poor attached people. Today, as I travel the length and breadth of the state of New South Wales in my official duties, I see the legacy of our early governors, and especially Macquarie, in so much of our lifestyle and shared values. I see it in the courage of our farmers, the men and women on the land, as they contend with drought and other trials, who never give up. I see it in the spirit of our servicemen and women peacekeepers abroad, who, like Macquarie, serve their country with respect for others, with dedication and professionalism. I see it in the character of our people, their warmth, lack of pretensions, the absence of artificial social boundaries. Marsden hated him because he invited former convicts to government house. Their rejection of vain glory and superficial status, their pragmatism, the belief of most in the fair go. The Australia of today, whatever the challenges, 
would have been a source of great satisfaction and indeed of pride for Lachlan and Corrie. Sadly, however, with Elizabeth and young Lachlan, he returned to England a broken-hearted man and died exactly two years later in London on the 1st of July, 1824. The news of Macquarie's death received some weeks later in Sydney produced great outpourings of sadness and four days of official mourning were announced. And on the same day, and this is extraordinary, news was also received that the parliamentary bill which would restore civil rights to emancipants had been given the royal assent. And in the Australian newspaper of the 11th of November, 1824, the newspaper established during Macquarie's term, William Wentworth, who is often referred to as Australia's greatest native son, quoted these lines of Alexander Pope in homage to the late governor. Statesman yet friend to truth, of soul sincere in action, faithful and in honour clear, who broke no promise, served no private end, who gained no title, and who lost no friend. Indeed, an eloquent and fitting tribute to a man whose legacy I believe we all share today. Thank you. <laughs> bring people together, widen the door, you know, contribute to the harmonious community that we enjoy. Uh, nevertheless, they don't have the autocratic um, uh, power. Although it's very interesting, not many people, I guess other than uh, the Honourable Gillian Skinner would know that the government does some, have some reserved powers. You cannot set I cannot sack a government. The governor cannot sack the government, despite the fact that the hundreds, thousands of people thought so a couple of years ago. Uh, to the same extent, I was getting sackfuls of mail begging me to do so. And, and, and this was this was 
This was not only uh, reported in the newspaper, but it was the subject of an extraordinary cartoon in uh, what the day of Telegraph, which I mentioned later, but I, I knew I couldn't because I'm not Robert McGowan. You know, we live in, we live in, a, we live in a wonderful democratic, uh, uh, you know, governed by a wonderful democratic constitution with the three tiers of government. While you do have uh, the ability to warn, to delay, to seek more research on something that the government may want to pass into law, you can get your own research as well. And you can warn, but you cannot refuse to sign. Well, you can. You can refuse to sign it and resign. But you can't refuse to sign it and stay there. And this is how our nation, our states are protected from dictatorial dangers. But when uh, I was getting, it was no secret, sacks full of letters to uh, sack the government, I did seek constitutional advice from Canberra, from our eminent constitutional law uh, expert in Sydney, because then I was able to write a letter that was absolutely accurate in the legal sense. Uh, but the Daily Telegraph had a most wonderful cartoon. It was around Christmas time. And there was the portico of Government House, with which you're all familiar. And the butler, we don't have a butler, but the butler was at the door. And a lady with dark hair and a slightly long nose was looking around the corner. <laughs> and there was a, a reindeer standing up speaking to the butler. And over to one side, near the garden, was Santa Claus and the other five reindeers. And the cartoon said, this was a reindeer speaking, Santa wants to know why she's getting more mail than he is. <laughs> Social commentators in front of the <laughs> However, yes, so the, the powers are, are limited, but there's flexibility there. The wealth of the government, I think, as in Macquarie's time, as I tell the captains and vice captains who come to government house, the governor is the servant of the people. That's what the government is, and that's a very lovely line. Thank you, Your Excellency Tim James, it's my name. Thanks for a rich and entertaining and illuminating presentation tonight. I learned a great deal, I'm sure we all did, and it leads to my question, which is do you think that current generations are taught enough about uh, Governor Macquarie? Uh, amongst other governments and, and their vision and their values and, and their early achievements? Well, I truly believe that then I do have, a, I've always had a, 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 a bias towards Australian history. We don't teach enough of it. We don't teach it the right way. There is so much in it that sets an example for goodness and decency. When you look through our history, it is very difficult to find many rogues, and I think this is why we all adore Ned Kelly so much. He's almost the only American we've got. I'm serious. You think about it. I'm, when I come down, I'd like you to tell me who you think the bad people are in, in Australia's history from Philip Longworth. Bly wasn't so bad. If you read Bly's, um, Bly's diaries and French Christians report, I mean, they were two men who had to do perfection for one another, and uh, Bly was terrified of them. You know, what, what would, uh, would happen if he wasn't so autocratic? He was in a very small, the bounty was not much larger than one of the reasonable yachts on the house. Your Excellency, thank you for a, a really enjoyable address tonight. Um, 
Muslim horror was quite a name, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it's Scottish. It's great to hear such a wonderful speech from you. And uh, we live in Australia in this wonderful multicultural society where we have people that have come from almost every corner of the globe and are now Aussies. What makes this defining characteristic of an Aussie that we are all so enormously proud of, that is a core to our nation? What is the defining characteristic that makes an Aussie and will continue to bind us together as Aussies as we come from every nation in the world? Well, that's a very complex um, question. Did you hear what Mr. Corbett asked you? Yes. It's complex, and I mean, I'll be re um, responding as uh, a child who's had a most extraordinary, wonderful life, born in a rural area to a wonderful family in halcyon days with guns and the Murrumbidgee River and so forth. And, you know, it's our landscape, it's our spirit, it's, don't laugh, it's the cockatoos and the galahs, the way they are not frightened of us, it's the, it's finally too, the legacy of the way the Indigenous people have looked after this continent. We can prove for 40,000 years in the south to 60,000 in the north, carbon dating, I mean there's an incredible spirit in this country. The fact that our land is girt by sea, we have no borders with others. We don't. We haven't had invasions. We haven't uh, suffered the terrible experiences that even North and South America have, let alone Europe and Africa. Um, when you think modern Australia is only two hundred and twenty-four years old, and I think a standard was set by the ethics of Philip and those who followed. You know, I mean, it wasn't just that he was the captain of the Royal Navy. He had the benefit of being the child of an older mother who was the widow of a Royal Naval captain and a German father at the time of the German Enlightenment who was a teacher who came to England. To teach, so you can imagine this little boy growing up in a family where mother was a bit older and had suffered and therefore had a maturity. And the father was a man who came from the most enlightened country in Europe other than Scotland. Look, no bias, but the German Enlightenment. You know, let's face it, look in the history books about the German Enlightenment and the Scottish Enlightenment. They were the literate people who influenced all those countries around them. And uh, so there was that, they, I think they were ethical men. How many, as I say, how many rogues have we got? If you look into the documents, only about three weeks ago, I managed to uh, uh, come across the 1792 edition, second edition of, um, of uh, Hunter and King, who were the second and third, respectively, leaders on the first fleet from Horden House, or the treasure it is. But reading, reading the account of those naval officers, you can see and feel the respect in their journals for the Indigenous people. You know, when they went up, for example, to Broken Bay, in other words, pit water, and uh, on one occasion they were coming home and they found a girl very ill, an Aboriginal girl, very ill, feverish, with uh, evidence of smallpox. So, you know, they settled her down and got her some food or whatever. You know, there's, there's somehow a quality of decency that runs through our early history. You look at the number of massacres, there was Appen, but by and large, when you think of other countries, there were attempts to ensure harmonious interaction with the Indigenous people. Look at Philip said at the very beginning, we must do all that we can to reconcile them by having us living amongst them. They realised they were the 
first Australian organisation. So I think there are many blessings, you know, and the climate, the bounty of the sea, the sea food, the healthy. That was a total trouble. That's why they sent Commissioner Bigger. The convicts were writing home and saying, it's marvellous <laughs> that we're healthy, we're happy, and the food's good, and the governor's adorable. Thank you, Your Excellency. Just a question. Um, I think probably the journey in the last couple hundred years has been how we've come from a, um, a society where the governors were the autocratic rulers to democracy and gained uh, elected governments. How do you see it a hundred years from now? Is how do we protect the vice position versus the political system? And how do we uh, bridge the short termism that comes from our democratic principles today. Do you have a view about where it might be 100 years from now? Well, I can't predict, but when the young people who come to Government House, and I'm very fortunate, one of the lovely, loveliest tasks or roles that I'm asked to take on, and this was begun in the time of Sir Roden Cutler. The captains and vice captains of all the high schools in New South Wales come to Government House <coughs> over the period of the year. And this is organised by the Department of Education. <coughs> and it includes private and public schools. Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Islamic, the lot eventually come. And uh, they get a, a talk from me on the constitution of three tiers of government and what the role of the governor is, and then I open it to questions. And invariably, one question, usually the very last and gingerly put, is what do you think about the possibility of a republic or how things will change, and so forth. And I turn the question around immediately to them. What do you think? This is my psychiatric training, you see. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? You're the one who said that. Tell me. What do you want? And ask them what do they what do they want in Australia today that they want to change in terms of our style of, of democracy, uh, our controls, our lack of controls, all of those things. And and they regard this in depth, and their answers are wonderful, but invariably they come back and say, no, we wouldn't want a republic like the United States, we wouldn't like, want one like Italy or France, or they come back, you know, and someone always says, if it ain't broke, why well, fix it? You know? But I mean, there will be evolutionary changes depending on the population, I dare say. But again, people come here, people are risking their lives to get here illegally because what they know about the place seems to appeal. There are other places to which they can go. I think that, I think, and I don't want to get into trouble or conflicted uh, areas here, but I think that gatekeeping has served this country well in the past. And I think that. Uh, but to some extent, that must uh, continue. <laughs> and if you want to do that with wisdom as well as compassion, I believe. Mm. Thank you, that, that's where we need to go. Mm. We, we need a direction. But the, the problem is we go through a change. Certainly, yes. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And you know, it's special because I think Australia's, Australia's uh, acknowledging its responsibility to the neighbourhood. We can balance two giants, we can juggle two giants, can't we? I think we can. But also, even today in the Churchill Fellowship Awards, 
there are young Australians are looking at ways in which we can be of more use to our small and struggling neighbourhood in the Pacific Islands and elsewhere. And there's a strong commitment to go to East Timor and see what Australia and Australians are doing there is, is amazing, it really is. And, and this is not uncommon. Where New Guinea, we're getting, getting better at helping now too. They've gone through a terrible period of uh, treatment-resistant tuberculosis and treatment-resistant malaria. And I met a doctor yesterday who said they've got a new drug that they think will work. And look, the Sydney, Sydney researcher uh, that will be effective against the malaria. So we're not, we're not just uh, becoming uh, full of our own importance and forgetting those who need us. That would be terrible.